camera captures video and produces a stream of pixels, plus synchronization, an active video signal, and a pixel clock. The serializer's job is to convert all those signals to a serial bitstream running at several gigabits per second that can be accurately received at the deserializer regardless of what the data actually is. Tricky. Trickier still that we're going to do all this over a single piece of coax or over a single twisted pair. How do we make all that work? There are three factors that we need to think about. First, DC balance. The signal that we put on the cable must contain no aggregate DC level, and we can achieve that by making sure the number of ones and zeros remains equal. The difference between the number of ones and zeros is called the disparity, and our goal is to keep the disparity at zero, and if it deviates from zero, to get it back to zero as quickly as possible. The second factor is clock recovery. After all, the transmitter clock and the receiver clock aren't synchronized to some master clock source, so the receiver has to synchronize its clock to the incoming bitstream. But that means the incoming bitstream must be rich in level transitions. It can't stay in one state for too long, or the local oscillator at the receiver may drift and lose synchronization. The third factor is EMI. Now, it's well understood that a train of pulses will generate harmonics at multiples of the pulse frequency. But if the pulse train has a regular pattern, then the signal will also contain subharmonics as well. And these subharmonics could easily reach down into the UHF or even the VHF bands and create unacceptable interference. To meet these goals, it's necessary to transform what might be unruly input data, like a long string of zero bits that would upset both DC balance and clock recovery, into a form that fulfills disparity, clock recovery, and EMI requirements. But how? The answer involves two steps. First, we scramble the data using an algorithm known to both the serializer and the deserializer. Scrambling breaks up any patterns in the data that might lead to the generation of subharmonics. Then we take the scrambled data and apply it to an 8B, 10B encoder. This block takes 8-bit chunks of the scrambled data and selects 10-bit code words to represent the 8-bit chunks. And it does this in such a way that transition density and disparity requirements are met. Let's start with the scrambler. Generally, you scramble a data stream by mixing it with a second pseudo-random stream of data that's easily created at both the sending end and the receiving end. In GMSL, we pass the data through a 43-bit linear feedback shift register. You may be familiar with LFSRs. They're the mechanism that is used to generate CRCs for many different communication protocols. In GMSL, the pseudo-random bitstream is synchronized between the transmitter and receiver and then is mixed with the data stream to produce the randomized data. At this point, the data looks very much like a random sequence of bits, even though it isn't random at all. But we need very specific characteristics in this bit sequence. We need a guaranteed density of bit transitions, and we need guaranteed zero disparity. That's where 8B, 10B encoding comes in. We want to map the 256 possible combinations of 8 bits onto the 1024 possible combinations of 10 bits, such that each mapping has some guaranteed density of signal transitions. And every word has the same number of 0 bits as 1 bits, that is, has a disparity of 0. Can it be done? Well, sadly, no. First, even if we took every combination of exactly 5 1 bits and 5 0 bits, that's only 252 states. And that includes codes like a string of 5 1 bits followed by a string of 5 0 bits, and that's exactly what it is we're trying to avoid. So if we're going to map every 8-bit code onto a 10-bit code, we'll need to include some 10-bit codes that contain four ones and six zeros, and some codes that contain six ones and four zeros. 
but a code that contains six ones and four zeros increases the disparity by two. And a code that contains four ones and six zeros decreases the disparity by two. <laughs> what gives? The solution is to assign two 10-bit codes to some 8-bit input words. According to the rules of 8B10B, some 8-bit input codes will have just one 10-bit representation. Some 8-bit input codes will have two 10-bit representations, each with 5 1-bits and 5 0-bits. And some 8-bit input codes will have two 10-bit representations, one with six ones and four zeros, and a second code with four ones and six zeros, and those are the interesting ones. Then, if the disparity needs to be reduced, we choose the code that reduces the disparity by two. And if the disparity needs to be increased, we choose the code that increases the disparity by two. By starting the disparity count at minus one, we can make sure that the aggregate disparity is always minus one or plus one, never larger, and interestingly, the disparity will never be precisely zero, but it will alternate around zero at a distance that's never greater than one. And this really opens up the possible number of codes. The total universe of codes that contains four, five, or six one bits is 672 codes. But since 4-bit and 6-bit codes will be paired, that does reduce the universe to 462 codes. That's still plenty to choose from. And by choosing them carefully, we can guarantee that no more than 5-bit times elapse before there's a signal transition. So, 256 input codes and 462 possible code points. Well, clearly, there are going to be a few left over, and some of these codes can be used for a kind of out-of-band signaling. There are 12 codes called K-codes that can be used for signaling. Three of those codes are called comma codes, and they contain a unique pattern that doesn't appear in any other 10-bit code. Thus, these codes can be used for line synchronization, and that's a necessity because the 10-bit symbols are sent one after another without framing. Before data can be accurately interpreted in the receiver, the receiver must align on a series of synchronization symbols sent by the transmitter and then depend on the clock edges to keep its clock synchronized with the transmitter clock. Other K codes can be used for any other purpose, and in different systems that use 8B, 10B encoding, they serve many different functions. In GMSL, they're used for error detection and framing of fields within the bitstream. The point is that by the time the receiver gets the stream, it's been processed in such a way that EMI is reduced, clock recovery is assured, DC offset is eliminated, and the stream can be properly decoded. And, of course, 8B, 10B encoding isn't the only game in town. Some newer GMSL devices up the ante with 9B, 10B encoding. In this method, the stream is organized into 9-bit input words and mapped onto 10-bit code words. Now, since the input universe is twice as large, 512 elements, the mapping and disparity management is a little bit more complicated, but the code efficiency goes from 80% to 90%, so the complexity can definitely be worth the trouble. So far, we've addressed two out of our three concerns, transition density so that we can reliably recover the clock, and zero disparities so that the signal can be sent over an AC-coupled transmission line. But what about the third concern, electromagnetic interference? Well, the good news is that scrambling and coding have a profound effect on EMI, and Maxim has the test results to prove it. Dim the lights, and we'll see how that looks. First, we generated a GMSL signal that represented a white screen, that's an all ones pattern, with an audio channel and control information. We set up a loop antenna near an unshielded segment of a twisted pair transmission line, so this is definitely not a real world case. We're just trying to get an idea of how much EMI mitigation can be achieved with coding and scrambling. Here's what the spectrum looked like with no coding and no scrambling. Notice the level of the peak, minus 50 dBm at one half the bit rate or 1.5 gigahertz. 
Now let's turn on the scrambler. The most obvious thing you notice is we now have multiple peaks spaced at a little more than 2 MHz, but the less obvious thing is the amplitude of the center peak. It's been reduced by about 10 dBm. The scrambler has effectively moved some of the energy from the central peak and spread it among those newly created peaks. Now let's turn on the coder. Right off the bat we see that there are more peaks, but we also see that the central peak has been reduced another 6 dBm. Obviously coding and scrambling have had a positive effect on EMI, but looking at all these peaks one can't help but think that there's more that could be done. There is. Up to now we've been sending bits at precise intervals. But what if we made the bit interval a little less precise? Not enough to dramatically wreck the eye diagram, but enough to smear those peaks out just a little. Maxim serializers include a spread spectrum modulator that very slightly changes the frequency of the serializer clock. When you apply this spread spectrum modulation, just look what happens to the noise. Just a half percent of spread spectrum modulation reduced the peak by just over 20 dBm. But look at what happened to the noise floor. Instead of being down about minus 105 dBm, it's now about minus 90 or so dBm. In other words, we've massively reduced our peak levels, but at the expense of pretty significantly raising the apparent noise floor. Now, in most applications, this is a worthwhile trade-off. Regulatory bodies just want the radiated emissions to fit under a mask. As long as the peaks are under the mask, they're happy. And broadband noise is easier to manage in most communication systems than an interfering signal at a particular frequency. So the lesson here is that all these mitigation efforts don't actually reduce the amount of energy that escapes into the ether. They just redistribute the energy to make the effect less objectionable. It's still up to you as the system engineer to follow best practices and make sure the RF energy stays inside the box and inside the transmission line. But now you know how Maxim can reliably send multi-gigabit streams and still keep EMI under control in harsh environments like, you know, an automobile traveling down bumpy roads at highway speeds. Stay tuned for more about how Maxim's GMSL technology makes moving data around the car easy. <laughs>